Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with letting each of these ladies introduce themselves. Tamara, you want to start? Yeah, I'm Tammy Parker. I'm the, oh yeah, we're supposed to move closer to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tammy Parker, the CEO of Unicycle Business Consulting. I do offsite human resources support for small businesses. My clients are business owners who did not go into business to read labor law. I do that for you. Um, I've been doing human resources work for about 32 years, so. My name is Ginny Huxley. I am the owner and founder of Huxley CPA Consulting. I do what's called fractional chief financial officer work for small businesses. <clears throat> so higher, it's kind of everything between bookkeeping and taxes, um, higher level financial strategies, are you charging enough for your services and products, forecasting, budgeting, um, things like that. And I've been in business about five years. How long have you been doing it? A CPA? lot longer than How long that. Have been, yeah. Well, I've, I've been in a consulting business for five years. I got licensed as a CPA in 2000, so I've got like 25 years of experience from a little bit in, oh, in my background. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Clarifying point. <laughs> my name is Becky Ezell. I'm the owner and founder of Smart Book Business Solutions. We provide bookkeeping, accounting, and payroll for small businesses all over northern Colorado, pretty much anywhere we could do it. But um, I've been in business. Uh, for about 13 years, been doing bookkeeping work for about 25. And what's your other business? I just opened a bookkeeping and payroll school. So mm -hmm. we just opened Keep Smart Books Academy, started in January, uh, and we introduced the intro to bookkeeping and payroll courses. It's a state accredited program where <coughs> people can leave with their certificate. Nice. So, yeah. It's also a nonprofit. <laughs> Sorry, we're each other's advocates, can you tell? Yeah, I'm like, we're all friends. We're yeah. friends. Yeah. We share clients a lot, yeah. um, and we are each other's cheerleaders, really. Yes. So, to tie into that, I'm Sarah Burton, and I actually work for Unicycle Business Consulting here with Tammy. So, um, I do have a sign up. All these ladies do have newsletters and information. I'm, I'm going to start passing this around because I know we have a limited amount of time. So, if you would like to sign up, I'm going to go ahead and let you all. And you don't have to sign up for all three. If you just want to know what a CFO has to say, you can just sign up for deeds, things so like just, that. There's just a box on the right-hand side about yeah. to check off which one you want, so we don't have to fill it out three times. So Efficiency. That's <laughs> <one's fun. laughs> uh, to start you ladies off, um, would everyone please answer, what is the most common thing that a small business gets wrong? From an HR piece, oh, sorry, we're going to have, she's going to ask us some questions, and then we're going to let you guys ask questions. We would prefer you ask all the questions. We just have some to kick off. Uh, from an HR piece, for me, it's um, employee classification, whether somebody needs to be a W-2 employee or a 1099, and where's the line on that? Um, the federal government does keep ratcheting those classifications down a little harder. Um, basically... The first line in the sand is if they do this thing that you charge your clients for, they should be a W-2 employee. Um, however, um, my best advice for anybody who has 1099 employee or 1099 contractors, they are not employees, never call them that, um, is to make sure that they have their own business entity. That's going to protect you the most. They need a business registered with the state. Um, they need their own insurance, things like that will really protect you. So employee classification, W-2, part-time, full-time, salary versus hourly, and then 1099. That's one of the things that small businesses most often get wrong in the early years. Janine? I would say um, the biggest issue that I see is not, um, not having your pricing for your products and services set up properly. Um, if you don't charge enough uh, for the services and for the products to cover all of your general expenses and all of your overhead, you're not going to have any profit at the end and you'll be losing money. And if you do that for too long, you'll run yourself out of business really quick. So I would say that's the biggest, most important thing that, um, that businesses need to get right very early on or you're going to just run yourself into the ground real quick. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I'm going to uh, come on the tail of that one. So one of the mistakes I've seen over and over and over again is people hiring too fast. Mm -hmm. So they'll bring on an employee thinking, I'm, you know, I'm out of time, I need help, or, hey, I want to hire my sister or my aunt or whatever to help me with this business without understanding the ramifications of what it takes to have an employee. Mm -hmm. um, they are by far the most expensive part of any business. Mm -hmm. So if you don't consider payroll taxes, the cost of providing maybe a, a laptop for them, a desk, mm -hmm. a phone, all of those expenses come into play when you're trying to figure out, can I even afford to hire an employee? 
So those are good questions to ask. You can go ahead and go to questions in the audience if people were excited to ask stuff. We just had some stuff back up if everybody, people got too shy to start with. So <laughs> I don't know who it was in the back. Did you have a question in the back? No. no oh, okay. That's the first part, so I was just like chiming in. Oh, oh, oh got okay. it. Okay. okay. So that, that is true. At any point, if anyone does want to chime in or have a question, please raise your hand or go ahead and shout out to us. Um, so for this, uh, what is the most important thing you wish every small business owner knew? From an HR piece, the most important thing I wish that you all knew is that the best way to set your employee up for success, any employees, is to have clear expectations and to have frank conversations around those. And you really can have expectations around attitude and helpfulness and determination, but knowing ahead of time what those expectations are, you create the opportunity for this, the employee to succeed. It's those jobs that one, don't have a job description at all. By the way, Colorado law says you have to have a job description for every role in your business. Um, we write those all the time, but you can find them online. <laughs> That is one of the best things that you can put, that you can have to talk about those conversations. And what do they, what are the most important things? What do they need to be proficient at to really function well for you? Um, and then I would also recommend that you pay attention to what you can teach people and what you can't teach people. You can teach people your, your processes. You can't teach people um, to be a good community member in your business. So when sourcing talent, just keep those things in mind. But setting clear expectations would be my best advice. Go ahead. I have a question um, around the team building part of this for any of you that would be um, relevant to the answer. So I have, I'm at a place of growing where I have three assistants right now. One is in India, one is in um, North Carolina, one is in California. They all own their own businesses, so I'm like, okay, I did that, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. um, and I've brought them on one at a time over the last four years, and the congealing part is what's lacking right now that I know I need to do better and more proactively. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just curious if you have advice or thoughts around ways to do that as smoothly, as swiftly as possible. Like, you know, team meetings, we're gonna need to start doing those, like yes. once a week, and one, sl you know, one Slack channel, not three that are oh. on all of their, no. I know you, it would make your head spin. It would make me crazy, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so, but that's the nature of how we all start, right? We right. all start with this one. So I'm in this, like, quagmire right now, feeling mm -hmm. like overwhelmed and frustration from, um, <clears throat> spinning my wheels, do you have any just feedback or advice? Yeah, I'll do. Yeah, I think so. Um, my first feedback would be um, either have separate meet, two separate meetings or, or separate your one once a week meeting because lots of meetings can get to be too much too. Right. So let's say you have an all hands meeting every Monday to set everybody up for success for the week okay. or every Friday to talk about what happened this week and next week, right? But I would parcel out and time it some time to get to know each other, to yeah. talk, to share something about you that's not about work. Um, I know an organization who is nationwide, it's a nonprofit, they specifically have an end of week meeting that's about not work. It's about, oh, I'm reading this interesting book, and, and it's just getting to know each other, and that starts letting them communicate together. And then the operational piece of that meeting is helpful for everybody too, to just know the why and what's going on in the other, what is everybody else doing, will help you start build your team. Good. Anybody else? You have more words. I don't have a team. I'm, I'm small like you, and I actually decided I don't want to hire any employees <laughs> because it was never my favorite thing to do. And the longer she works with me, the more she's like, no. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for reminding me why I don't want to hire employees or work with contractors. I want to do all that. But you've got a team and you've yes. got a business. So. Yeah, so my biggest piece of advice pretty much follows what Tammy was saying. Um, I do have an example of a, another business that is in uh, Minnesota. She has team members that live all over the United States. So, and she's done it the same way. Year by year, she adds a new member, right? So the disconnection can feel really great after a period of time. So what she's done is she's created those weekly team meetings so that everybody can, even though it's on Zoom, you're seeing each other's faces, you're hearing each other's voices, 
Uh, they have a check-in time where they can say, here's something new and interesting that's going on with me. So that, comes, that brings the personal piece in. Then the first time last year, she did a retreat where everybody flew to Arizona, spent three or four days over the weekend, so it wasn't really during business time. But the intention was, okay, let's talk about some policies and procedures for our work, but at the same time, this is about team building. We need to get to know each other. And the biggest thing she brought to the table that weekend was everybody has to come prepared to share what their superpower is. Mm. So it gives you some self-analyzing time to go, what is my superpower? And then she had, they had to share that with the rest of the group. So it's just fun stuff like that. Cool. Yeah. Really the intention on um, keeping team members <coughs> interested in staying with you as a business owner really is about culture, fit, um, do they enjoy coming to work? You know, those kinds of things. And since you're separated physically, it's about bringing them together somehow uh, using technology and making it still feel like you're together. That was a lot, sorry. What was the question again, Janine? Oh, we don't, are the, any others, or should we keep going with the... Oh, yeah, sorry, right. just raise your hand. <laughs> we don't have to get through all those questions. I know, <laughs> but I answered one, and I felt like you guys should answer it. Well, it was just, what is the most important thing you want a small business to know? Um... You know, one of the things I think a lot of small businesses fail to recognize is uh, what we call internal controls. And that just ensures that your, the money that you make is, stays yours and it doesn't get leaked out the side somewhere to somebody that's embezzling from you or committing fraud. And so one of the things, and one of the things you gotta be careful of is your bookkeeper has a lot of access to that financial information. So one of the, there are bookkeepers out there, she's not one of them, and I'll explain this in a second, um, that say, hey, I can do everything for you. I can record all your stuff, I'll pay all your bills, just give me access to your bank account, I'll take care of all of that. And to somebody, a business owner that um, might really like the sound of that, because it sounds great that you don't have to touch anything. That would have been me. Bad idea. <laughs> because if, as soon as you give that access to the bank account where they can move money, there, it's, it's too much of an invited thing. Um, there's actually some statistics out there that say, um, and I have a whole other separate to topic on internal controls, but the one that this boils down to is don't give your bookkeeper access to the bank account that they can move money. View only access <coughs> is fine and great and helpful. Not anything where they can move money without you knowing about it or without you signing off on it. Um, and then from, to kind of pitch that home, They've, they've done studies, and there are ten, roughly 10% 10 of people in, uh, that are out there will never steal from you, no matter what. They're just the highest level of ethics, and they won't steal anything. That's 10%. There's 10% that will always try to steal from you, no matter what. That leaves the 80% in the middle that, if given the opportunity and the motivation of uh, you know, a tough situation at home, they will steal from you. So unless you think you have perfect hiring abilities and can only hire the 10% of people that will never steal from you, highly recommend you keep good internal controls in place because it's, it's hard to think about that everybody thinks it's not gonna happen to them. Well, there's some easy, simple things you can put in place to actually help deter and prevent it from happening. And one of the biggest ones that I see in the really small businesses is they turn too many things over to the bookkeeper. Good bookkeepers will not accept access to move money at your bank account. They will not ask for it. They do not want it because the liability is too big for them. So that's the kind of bookkeeper she's not. <laughs> she's, um, Becky's one of the good bookkeepers that doesn't want that access. No, they want to be able you. to see activity, but not to move the money. Right. The liability becomes too great, especially when you add team members, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want that. My answer to that question would be, uh, business owners need to understand their financials. Mm -hmm. And that ties back into what Geneve was saying. If, if, first of all, you don't understand your financials and you've given your bookkeeper access to your bank account oh, no. information, <laughs> listen, bad, idea. bad, bad idea. Yeah. Uh, what could happen if you hired the bad bookkeeper but you understood your financials and reviewed them on a regular basis, uh, then you would see something doesn't look right. Why is my bank account balance going down? When I, you know, by thousands of dollars, I, I don't have any big expenses like that coming out. Those are the kinds of, kinds of things you would catch along the way. Mm -hmm. So understanding and looking at your financials on a regular basis is my biggest piece of advice. Yeah. Oh. Um, I am my own bookkeeper. 
Yay! I <laughs> barely understand my financials. Yes. I can understand them to a point. Mm -hmm. Some of the lectures before was discussing how to really analyze your financials and your sales and how to look at the past 12 months and how to predict the future. I don't know how to do any of that. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, kind of basic recommendation you can give someone like me to learn that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> yes. Unless you want to become a book. Are you saying is your business bookkeeping or your business no, is something really else? Business, um, mm -hmm. I do my books. Yeah. Okay. But I want to be able to look at my sales. I want to be able to take those numbers and make sense of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to school for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to answer a portion of that, and maybe we can take it next door later because I would have a, a much. I could talk for the entire hour about how to do this. <laughs> Um, yeah. Let's talk about forecasting because that's what a lot of us are interested in, right? Mm -hmm. we, we know what's happened, okay, if, if it can be recorded, and it is, then we take that information and now let's move it 12 months into the future. So the way I do that very simply is I'll look back at my previous 12 months, okay? In your industry, you're going to have some um, ups and downs, right? Because your, your business is going to peak during the summer. So when you're forecasting the next 12 months, you do that same thing. Now add some projected growth, if that's your plan to do some growth, okay? You could do a percentage growth. You could do a, a dollar goal growth. Growth dollar goal. <laughs> say that three times fast. And you would want to literally take a sheet and say January, February, March, April, okay? Now you take last year's January income, place it in that box. Now add your growth. Does that make sense? Same thing with expenses. If nothing expense is going to change in the future, in the in coming months, then everything can stay the same. But what I like to do is go, by May, I need to add an employee. So what is it going to cost me to add that employee there? And you build out the next 12 months. That's the easiest, most simple way to do that. Then you can mess around with it and go, well, I don't have a, enough money yet in April or May for that new employee, so what do I need to do back in sales to get that to happen? Does that help? And I, in my experience, and I don't work in numbers like them, um, but in my experience, clients are just afraid of, they're like, well, I'm just picking a number. Yeah, unless somebody here can read the future, if you can, I'd like to offer you a job. Um, <laughs> great. But that it's, I call it theoretical math. You know, if we want to set a goal of up 18 next year, if that's our financial goal, then you start with the plus 18 and you can go back and figure out what your numbers need to look like by month, things like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, it, people are afraid because they don't know for sure the number. But if we don't take the lead to try and plug those things in and set goals, we'll never know the number. Mm -hmm. We'll never, yeah. a goal that you don't set will never be hit. Yeah. And one more further thought on that, I'm just thinking of you as an example. I would even go, okay, if I know I need to add another or want to add another $20,000 in revenue for the year, take it down to how many jobs is that, right? Mm -hmm. So then how many customers is that? I mean, I get that granular mm -hmm. going, mm -hmm. okay, cool. If I know I need 20 new customers, done. Put me out there, you know, and I'll go get them, okay? And I'll, I'll just chime in a little bit more too and say it's, um, you get down to the granular level, like if you print out your P&L or you download your, your profit and loss, your income statement, um, it's got activities, right? There's a separate row for each individual type of expense. You do it one at a time. And you do start with last year and then you think about what changes. And when thinking about that new number, it's not gonna be perfect, but if you're, say, you're at, at a place where you're, the last several months you've made about $10,000 in revenue per month, is the next month after that gonna be a million? Probably not. Great if so, Probably not. So there's, think about like what's most probable. Add on, a, add on the growth, maybe add a little bit of a stretch in growth, but there's, there's likelihoods of stuff, right, um, that makes it a little bit more. And you just do your best. And it also is a goal of what to achieve too. It's a goal of what you want to move towards that helps you. And it's there to be helpful. So don't feel like you have to make it. You just, it's there to be helpful to kind of move forward for it. Right. Did you have a question? Yeah, so I do like finance and operations for my company. And so I, when I started, I was handed all, I have all of that. And I, and our owner doesn't understand financials in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and so what would you recommend in terms of like going backwards to put some of those controls in place? And job control in that ten percent, but I don't. You know, I want him to feel confident in that too. Oh, and you know what? The internal controls. And before I went out in consulting, 
I, if I took a job and they were, had poor internal controls, one of the first things I did was put good internal controls in place because that protected me as an employee. Because if money did go missing and it was possible for me to take it, oh crap, like that doesn't look good. But I wanted to build internal control such that there was no possible way for me to steal money because that protected me as an employee. Um, so are you asking about how do you put controls in place now? So, you, so that's all, the internal controls are not, um, they're not a numbers thing with your financials. They're processes and um, procedures that you have in place for that. So that's a go forward kind of a thing. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, I think, I think I have an article on my blog, on my website that I've written about internal control. I'm trying to remember, okay, thanks. I've written a lot, so I'm so sorry. To remember. Did I write about I that or is that on my list to be written? <laughs> Great. If you go to my website, I've got some, a breakdown of some, uh, uh, some articles, and there's one in there for internal, there's at least one in there for internal controls, according to Tammy. So, um, that'll give you some ideas of things to put in place um, in the business early on. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So how do you know when it's time to raise the price? Um, we sell products, and I know a lot of people in here sell services. So I'm just curious, how do you know when it's time to raise your price? And then how do you how do you manage that? Mm -hmm. Good question. I actually do, I'm sure I have an article about that on my website <laughs> because, I, because I've talked about that. Um, and my website is huxleycpa.com, by the way. I don't know if we have. Um, Huxley, H-U-X-L-A-Y-C-P-A.com. But if you um, sign up for my newsletter, then you'll see it there, too. Um, I, I guess I just kind of took that one. Sorry. No, answer. Um, answer. <laughs> I love it. Straight okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the easiest way to do it is to um, have a regular cadence for doing it. Like, every year, you raise your prices a little bit. If you do it in lumps, you're going to end up like looking at a 30% price raise, and that's going to shock a lot more of your customers. Mm -hmm. So it's better to consistently do it a little bit at a time. So like at least once a year, I would say. Um, it's probably painful to do it more than once a year um, if you're selling products. Um, watch your gross margin closely. Your gross margin is your revenue minus the cost of goods sold, what it costs you to either produce, uh, manufacture, or purchase the goods that you sell. <coughs> The revenue minus those cost of goods sold gives you what your uh, gross profit is. If you take that divided by your revenue line, that is your gross margin percentage. And watch that gross margin percentage because your vendors, I almost guarantee it, are raising their prices a little bit at a time. And if you don't keep an eye on what your vendors are charging you, it's going to slowly eat away at your profits. And the quickest way to see that um, is doing that gross margin percentage calculation and watching that like a hawk, month over month over month. Um, and I will give a caveat that the gross margin is most helpful if you're on accrual basis accounting and tracking inventory instead of cash basis accounting. Your gross margin will probably be all over the board, positive and negative, if you are on cash basis accounting. Um, so you really, as, as selling products, you really should be on accrual basis accounting. Okay. Do you have something to add? Becky? Nope, I just am like, yep, yep. <laughs> I have something to add real quick, sorry. Um, when I talk with clients about this, and I know it doesn't sound like HR when I talk with clients about this, but I do. Um, if your expenses go up, your pricing has to go up. From a talent retention piece, if we're giving annual reviews, we're giving merit increases. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your, your revenue has to go up, and your customer understands. Now, I agree, a 30% jump, that's tough. Uh, if you need it, I would recommend you do it. Right. Because, by the way, inflation has hit everybody, yeah. mm -hmm. including your business. Yep. So that's my feedback on that. Yeah. If you, I, one other thing on that, sorry. If, it, if, you, if you haven't raised them in a while, and we've gone through this big inflation piece, raise it, raise it as much as you can and do it as soon as you can now, because mm -hmm. people are expecting it. Customers are, are expecting yes. it a lot more. If you wait yes. another year or two... People will be like, wait a minute, we just had all this inflation, but it's in the news, people know about it, it's a lot easier and it's a lot more accepted by customers. Mm -hmm. And you also communicate, I don't know if you have recurring customers or if you're a, a brick and mortar walk-in store, which one are you? So, on online retailer. Oh, e-commerce stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you probably don't need to have a communication go out to your customers about prices going up. You don't have to worry about that as much. So, okay. That's what I was wondering about. So how far in advance do you... Publish that that price increase is going to happen. 
Do you have recurring customers that yeah. come to you all the time for your... You do it, I don't know how far in advance. 30 days. Uh -huh. yeah. It depends yeah. upon how large of a product you're selling, That's though, true. too. I mean, if you're selling services that are five to $10,000 a pop, you're going to want to give them enough time to build it into their budget the year before. Mm -hmm. So if they're on, most of them are on calendar year, they operate from January through December, you're going to want to start notifying your customers in the fall, September, October, when they're working on their budget, mm -hmm. so they can build your price increase into their budget, because mm -hmm. some of them, if they don't build it in, they're going to have to find a different supplier, and then you're out of a customer. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, so, yeah, yes. so I doubled my rates, and uh, or a little bit more than that, and mm -hmm. most of my clients have been in sticker shock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been doing my work for 30 years, so they were too low to begin with. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I haven't had the opportunity just with personal life to kind of get really clear about why why the value. I originally sent out the email a month before, and, and I've had new clients who called, and they're like, ah, and they run, and I've had clients who can't afford it, but I'm just in that middle ground of, mm -hmm. ah, did I make a mistake? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not, do I need to pull my weight differently? I know personally, having made the change, it's right for me, because I can offer an intake for my clients, and it's a free, and that's really $150 worth now, and I can step into the sessions in a completely different way, but I'm still, I feel like, I'm not, I don't know, I need something else to, to either sell it or... Is it service-based? Yeah. Okay, I want to give you two key phrases that I tell my service-based friends all the time. One, they're paying for the years, not the minutes. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's so years good. Years. So it took you years. 30 oh, years to learn okay, how to yeah, do something right, okay. in 30 minutes. They owe you for the years, not the minutes. Here's why. When I, and we all undercharge, that's my other point for you. <laughs> we all devalue our work too much. I don't anymore, so that's Correct. good. Correct. But I also don't have the repeat clients because my you clients will. are like, ah. You okay. will. I want to say, I want to go see the course, it's going to work out. Okay. But here's the thing, and I'll give you my example of my business. When, when you hire an HR person and they walk in and they have the forms and they have a degree and they have all the things, right, but they're brand new, it's going to take them a lot more time to do what I do and they're not going to know this fast for you. When I walk into a business, 32 years of HR is, is in your back pocket. I joke that we've seen it all. <laughs> and then something happens Don't I've never that. seen. <laughs> nope, I cannot believe that person was sipping off a hip, hip flask in your business in the middle of a meeting. I have seen that, so that wouldn't count. Uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> they're paying for the years. Like the insight that we bring with our years and that you bring to your customer with your years yeah. is has depth and breadth and is faster and is more detailed. So it might just be for me personally to yes, take the time to set that back on my website, to really just feel into that and write yes, it. Absolutely. And, and yeah, but what I love is that you said it feels right to you, and yeah, therefore I know so it's right. Matters. Okay. What I, what I, the other thing I've seen too is when it's communications where you've got to send a letter out if you have repeat customers and you want to send a letter out because you want to warn them about the price increase. When you write that communication, 95% of that communication should be all about the value and exper yes. experience and expertise that you bring. And a little 5% at the end, by the way, our prices are going up to XYZ starting X, you know, ABC yeah. date. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really about communicating that value better. And I actually have a book maybe you might be interested in reading too that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Okay. You wrote it? No, I didn't, no, no, no. Oh, For, like, book wow. recommendation. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm an alien Secrets. now. I don't. I don't write. <laughs> oh, awesome. No, it's somebody else that um, that I think might be might be good. So remind me afterwards. Oh, Thanks. Brett, do you have any input on? No, pricing? that was so good. A lot so of this is, is based around. I've got. Oh, we do have one. Well, I was just going to comment from a former business where I ran into that too. Service kind of stuff, same sort of thing. It might work for your business if if you wanted to give some kind of a loyalty. Mm -hmm. yes. bonus to people who are sticking with you. Like yeah. Maybe you don't raise it as much on them. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Or you give, what idea. we did is we gave people the opportunity to just prepay mm -hmm. at the current rate. Oh, yeah. And oh, actually you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody who was complaining about yeah. paying you $75, if all of a sudden you're going to raise it to 150 it's like, I'm going to buy a 20-pack. <laughs> it's like, where do you come up with all this money when you're complaining about it? But, 
That's great. Advice. That's great. Advice. I've done that in my I've business, and it well. works. Yeah. 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 Or another idea on that is grandfathering um, yes. uh, for maybe six months or a year. Yep. Mm -hmm. Your current clients can pay the old rate for that long, so they get, have time to plan into it. Mm -hmm. But the new conversations with new customers, everything on your website is all of the new rates. Yeah, I did it for thirty days, and I had a number of people who jumped in at that rate, and that was great. But. So I don't know that I can go back to that, but I like the idea of the loyalty program because mm -hmm. I have a lot of people who will work with me once or twice a year, and I notice that they're not doing that right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You only need that if you still need to fill up your capacity, right? Because if you're already, we found, we raised our rates and we thought we were raising them too high. And when we looked back at it, we did not see any drop off in the number of appointments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We saw, we lost some clients. Right. Mm -hmm. But we, we didn't have an open slot. Okay. So we obviously didn't even raise it enough, potentially. But yeah. you need to, if you have the capacity, go ahead and discount. If it doesn't matter, then why? Yeah. Right. Okay. And then also take a look at your revenue too, because it may if you've lost um, fifty percent of your clients, but you've doubled your rates, you're at the same revenue okay. with a lot more capacity. Okay. So take a look at your numbers and see if you're still actually ahead of the game, even with the attrition of clients that you've had. Okay. Thanks. We've talked a lot about money. Becky, uh, when is the right time to hire a bookkeeper? <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> before, you, before Q1. Be, before Q1 is always good. No. Honestly, my answer really is if, if you can do it right away, that's the best time to do it. A lot of people don't. They, a lot of people think they want to do it themselves, right? I can do this. Uh, and then they realize this isn't fun. I don't even understand <laughs> what I'm doing. It's fun for me. It's fun for me. Not for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're a special we're breed, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, but really, in all honesty, if, if it's not a possibility right up front, then as soon as you're uh, running where you have maybe anywhere from 10 to 50 transactions a month, that's probably a good time to go. I'm spending more time away from building my business and actually increasing my revenue because I'm doing something I don't like and I don't really understand, I'm fixing errors I'm making, all those sorts of things, now it becomes more cost effective to hire somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you go do your trade. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I, I would echo that too. Um, what I also would say is there, um, and I don't, I don't charge for bookkeeping, that's not a service that I provide, I know how to do it, but I usually work with my, the bookkeepers that my clients have, either they're outsourced like Becky or they're in-house. There are bookkeepers that will charge $25, $35 an hour, and I will tell you they, they probably do not understand accounting. Um, I, when I first started consulting, I realized I wanted to um, find some bookkeepers to recommend, but I'm like, wait, I don't, I don't know if they understand accounting, because a lot of people think bookkeeping is easy, and it's not easy. It's just that you don't know when it's wrong. You don't know what it's supposed to look like, so you don't know if it's wrong. But then when I look at something like your financial statements, and somebody who doesn't know accounting, I'm like, what is that? And I've never heard of this, and what is that doing over here, and why do you have an account called deposits and equity? Um, and so the, um, it's really hard to be able to, for me to be able to help clients build the financial strategy and understand what those projections look like if, I don't, if, I, if the current statements that they have don't make sense to me as somebody that's an expert in that, as a CPA. So... Um, and so it's it's better to you're gonna your numbers are gonna be a lot more meaningful for you if you if they're correct and if they make sense to somebody that understands what they're supposed to look like. The other thing I will say is um, hiring a bookkeeper doesn't have to be something that is every month. Um, and tell me if I'm incorrect. No, but that's right. There's um, if you feel like you're a small business just getting started, you could just have. Um, have a bookkeeper come in once a quarter um, or look at your books um, once a year if you don't have very many transactions and they can catch up all of those months, do all the bank reconciliations and figure everything out for you and then you're good to go and you have those financial statements. Now that doesn't give you data in interim to understand and how to steer your business that way, right. but it does cut down on the cost a little bit mm -hmm. if, that, if you're really price That's sensitive That's more of a that. tax preparation view of bookkeeping. So yeah. That is the intention of somebody coming in once a year, even twice a year, to do your bookkeeping is more, I need something to get ready to hand to my CPA for mm -hmm. a tax return. Whereas if you need help realizing what are my revenues and expenses every month, then you need to hire somebody on a monthly basis. Yeah. Yep. 
We only have like seven minutes, so I want Talking to about hiring people, I am running into an issue a lot now where people are, I ask for two references, and mm -hmm. they either can only provide one because they've been working for DoorDash, or mm -hmm. the, they say the company is what they've been working for and no longer exists, or mm -hmm. something like that. So I'm just so confused about that. Like, how is that even happening? And so, and then my team's asking me, can we hire them? They just have one reference, and I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, is it a great reference, but no. What like, kind of work is it? Show up better. Um, they're doing gig work. They're going into no, what kind of work what do service do you provide? Um, promotions for food brands. So they're doing pop ups in stores. Mm -hmm. If you've ever gone and gotten this, oh, yeah. physical, oh, physical yeah. advertising. Yeah, pop ups. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, do you want my really frank advice on yes. references? Don't mean shit. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has an aunt who will give them a reference. Don't worry about it. You know, because <laughs> like, they should be able to hop through that hoop. Like, go work for your friend who has a business for two days and get They probably won't. Reference. They'll probably just tell their friend who owns a business to say the nice things. Yeah. That's, I don't care about references at all. Really? Really. But, but and the fact that they haven't, like, formally answered the, what I have said is what they need to do for the job, would you say? I would pick another hoop. I do like hoops. I like yeah, people that have to do Pick some things. Yeah. yeah, I like, I like that. make them do a test. Mm -hmm. There are like assessments the out there for customer service and extroversion and oh. yeah. speech, speaking clearly sales for you, marketing. sales and marketing quiz. Yeah. Oh, have awesome. them do an assessment Thank instead. So but I, as 32 years of HR, everybody can provide a, a, a reference and you don't know who you're really talking to and it doesn't matter at the end of the day. So. Thank you. Yeah. You got a question back there? Uh, going back to her um, employee uh, or thinking about hiring an employee, I didn't. Um, I had somebody that wanted to hire uh, be a contractor, and really, mm -hmm. and that's an area that I'll eventually go into. But I didn't check her references. What I did was uh, we had an interview, and she said she used to work for a dog company. And I asked her who that dog company was. I personally called the business owner and asked her, her would you hire this person again? She, Did she answer? Me, no. <laughs> <laughs> so there, actually, most businesses will not answer that question anymore. There's liabilities. So, yeah. The, clo the closest I got to for somebody that used to work for me that um, had then went on for another job and there were a lot of issues at the company. I was told that I couldn't comment on things. I had to say no comment. Mm -hmm. So what I did with the gal on the phone, she'd say, would you hire this person again? No comment. So did she have any issues with this? No comment. It's like, so I, I said no comment with um, appropriate emphasis. And after all the, <laughs> on the, <nose. laughs> of the, of the fourth, the fourth or fifth time I said that, she's like, okay, I think I have the information I need. Thank you very much for the call. <laughs> So I work with what I can That's say good. at the company. Yeah. That is good. Oh, where do I search for um, some of these assessments? Uh, so cool. Test Gorilla is, um, you do pay, it's a certain amount of months, but they have uh, a exhaustive list of assessments that you can choose from, even like in different languages. So if they are more into a Spanish market, they have a ton in Swedish right now. Mm -hmm. um, I know. <laughs> it's a Swedish I know. Um, that's, Indeed. But even on if you're hiring through Indeed, they have automatic assessments that you can pick to, and they'll give so you if they're proficient, they're familiar, experts. Right. So it'll give you the feedback when they apply. It sends them the test to take automatically and let you know if they're taking it or not. Awesome. So it's one less kind of screening tool for you. Okay. Was there a question back there? Yeah, another HR question. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a landscaping business. We hired 20 something young men and women, but generally young men. A lot of them live at home still underneath their Mm -hmm. You know, that type of a scenario. Um, we're not really finding, we're finding employees right now. We're getting ready for the new season. They're lacking what I think is soft skills, you know, just like leadership. And sometimes they can look in the eye and shake, shake your hand, and, it, and it's great. Um, we don't always get that. Mm -hmm. Is that something that can be trained? Good question. Oh, looking somebody in the eye and shaking their hand? Like, no, no. that just, part, that, okay. that's the basic. Okay. You know, like, kids got to be trained on taking phone calls now because they don't call oh, yeah. Right? Is the soft skills of management and leadership yes, can be trained. you feel that's trainable? And I do feel that that's trainable. Find some resources. 
It's raining. Um, so I, I happen to lead a management boot camp in my client spaces where I give teach leaders how to be leaders and stay legal at all times for their to protect the business. Um, there are there's lots of leadership programs out there. There's YouTube videos. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things, but I do believe leadership can be trained. However, one of my key things that I look for is in when I'm interviewing is hiring coachable people. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so I ask them a lot about the, their life and without asking anything inappropriate, right? But people who have been coached in some way are coachable in my experience. And it's not just athletes. Yes, athletes. Like, what did, you know, tell me about you. What do, what do you do, like to do for fun? And they go, oh, well, I love lacrosse or whatever, right? If they've been coached by somebody other than their parents, they're coachable in my experience. Mm -hmm. But um, not, just co not just athletes. Um, kids who, theater kids, um, band kids, choir kids, they have to literally listen to everybody around them and behave with them. Uh, it's not just about athletes. So it could be a million things. It could be debate club, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I want to see somebody who has had to step up and hear bad feedback from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think that they're, they're available for more feedback and growth. I also like to listen to self-evaluation, um, somebody who can answer a question about, that shows they've reflected on themselves in some way. Because that means they're curious to learning and growing. So that's, those, that's what I would look for. And then if I had an existing employee that I really wanted to, to coach up, I would make sure that they understood that this was for their development, that this was going, that I was investing in them in time and energy, and that this would follow them their whole life. Mm -hmm. Learning how to be a leader goes everywhere with you. Mm -hmm. So that is our time. Um, we are.